Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our keynote presentation for ITS Day 2018. We are extremely fortunate to have with us this afternoon Dr. Stephen Crocker, who is uh, an internet pioneer. Um, before we hear from Dr. Crocker, uh, we will present him with an award to recognize his contribution to internet innovation. And to start that process, I will say a few words about Dr. Crocker's work. As a graduate student at UCLA, Dr. Crocker was tasked to lead a team uh, to get the world's first computer network, ARPANET, up and running. To do this, computer research centers at uh, UCLA, at the Stanford Research Institute, at UC Santa Barbara, and at the University of Utah had to be connected. No one had ever done such a thing before. As Dr. Crocker wrestled with the complexity of this problem, it occurred to him that decisions made at UCLA could have an impact at all of the other network's nodes. Uh, something going wrong at UCLA could affect something at Stanford or at, uh, at the University of Utah. So recognizing that the actions taken at any network node could have a negative re repercussion on any other network node led Dr. Crocker to do some thinking. Uh, it was risky business to make a decision in such an environment, especially so for a graduate student. As anyone who's ever been a graduate student knows, the very last thing you want to do is to generate problems for your faculty supervisors. So Dr. Crocker envisioned a solution that would lessen the chances that decisions made at UCLA would tread upon the toes of researchers at the other network nodes. Dr. Crocker humbly named his solution the Request for Comment, or RFC. The RFCs would inform all who were working on the problems of creating the first computer network with what other researchers were doing with regard to those same problems. It would allow an open and inclusive approach to problem solving and innovation. Rather than top-down command and control, researchers would compare ideas and refine solutions to common challenges. The foundation provided by the RFC created an incubator for internet innovation. The RFC process supported and continues to support the development of key innovations of our internet era. For example, transformative technologies such as the Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, which was invented by Vince Cerf and Robert Kahn, was introduced through RFC 793 by Jonathan Postel, and it provided the foundation for internetworking. Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP, the foundation of the World Wide Web was advanced by Tim Berners-Lee through RFC 1945. The Session Initiation Protocol, the foundation of voice over internet applications, was introduced by Jonathan Rosenberg of, in RFC 3261. While there's some debate as to who the true father of the internet is, I believe that there's no doubt that Dr. Crocker is the father of internet innovation. However, it's important to note that Dr. Crocker's creation of the RFC has had an impact that extends beyond the technical operations of the internet. The RFC inspired a philosophy of openness and collaborative innovation. The RFC process has proved that when many eyes view the same problem, superior solutions are generated by collaborative, the, the collaborative process that follows. The success generated by the RFC process has inspired open source approachment to technology development and knowledge creation that has led to innovations like Linux and wiki-based problem solving. Dr. Crocker's contributions did not end with the RFC creation. Dr. Crocker was a founding member of the ARPANET Network Working Group, the precursor of the Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF, an organization that he continued to serve. He was the IETF's first area director for security, and he also served uh, on the IETF Administrative Oversight Committee. In addition, he served on the Internet Architecture Board and on the board of the Internet Society. Dr. Crocker provided extensive service to the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICON, uh, which concluded with his service, serving as ICON's chair starting in 2011, continuing to his retirement in November of, of 2017. In addition to this extensive public service, Dr. Crocker has also somehow found time to have an active profile in the private sector. He co-founded CyberCash Incorporated. Incorporated, Longitude Systems Incorporated, and his current company, Shinkuro Incorporated. For all of these reasons, we recognize Dr. Crocker's remarkable contributions to innovation. I will now turn the presentation over to Dean Titsworth, who will present the Stroger Award. Yeah. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to start by saying that uh, Trevor has done an outstanding job of planning uh, not only this event, but the other events, I, I believe, that went on for ITS Day. So let's give him a hand for all that work. In 1891, Almond Stroger was issued a patent for the first electromechanical telephone switch. Prior to Stroger's invention, telephone switching was completed using human operators. I actually remember that, believe it or not. As legend has it, Stroger, an undertaker by trade, believed that one of the telephone operators in his town was diverting business to his rival on the other side. As the saying goes, necessity is the mother of invention, and Stroger's automatic switch revolutionized the telephone industry, yet we do not know how it impacted his undertaking business. <laughs> Recognizing the role that innovation uh, of innovation in information and telecommunication industries plays, the J. Warren McClure School presents the Stroger Award to distinguished innovators in the field. This year, we honor Dr. Stephen Crocker, whose work on the RFC and numerous other technologies laid the foundation for the internet revolution, um, as, as Trevor uh, eloquently explained. The J. Warren McClure School is proud uh, to recognize Dr. Crocker's many accomplishments. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Crocker as, re as he receives the Stroger Award. Thank you. Too many things. Why don't you get on the other side? Of okay. Me? Oh, where he's here. So. Thank. Thank you. I'll put this back. Congratulations. Thank you very, very much. Happy to have you here. Mm, pleasure. Good, good. Well, th thank you, Dean. Thank you, Professor Roycroft. It's a genuine honor and uh, a real pleasure to be here today. Um, the, uh, the words about my accomplishments always uh, make me a little uh, uncomfortable because they took place a long time ago. Um, and um, in some ways, I still feel like a kid um, and now I'm back on college campus here. Um, I've got uh, a couple of stories to share with you and uh, a bunch of slides to help do that. There's um, a few notes buried uh, where you can't see them on the uh, attachments to the, uh, the notes section of the slides, and I'll leave a copy of the slides. So some of this is for follow-up in case people are interested and you'll see me going through these at variable speed. First, uh, thank yous to a few folks, some living, some not living, uh, including um, our man Stroger. Um, and uh, you'll see how these uh, show up a little. Uh-oh. There we go. So there's our hero. Um, you've all lived through a good portion of the internet revolution. Um, here's a slide and another one that follows that shows the um, awareness of the internet from a much earlier day. The picture on the left is the group at Bolt, Brannock and Newman that built the first routers that were part of the ARPANET. Uh, and that was the entire team. Uh, Tom Brokaw uh, introduces the idea of the internet in 1988 on television, and eventually uh, everybody and their grandmother became aware of the internet. Uh, that's a picture of uh, Scott Bradner's mother. Um, could have been my mother-in-law, who was a little quizzical when my wife tried to introduce me. Uh, my wife, my, my, her, her parents were a medical family. Uh, academic medical family, and uh, he's not a doctor? <laughs> a network? What's this network all about? And at one critical moment um, of very high tension when I tried to bring a terminal into their house uh, when my wife was ill and they were managing her care, 
uh, my mother-in-law, in the only confrontation that I ever had with her, met me at the door and saw this terminal that I was lugging at the time and said, there's no room for that in this house. <laughs> but time passed, and over the years, as my father-in-law um, uh, retired and started a newsletter that my mother-in-law uh, managed and was the uh, publisher and ran it out of the house, uh, we offered her a laptop so that she could manage the books and so forth. She took enormous delight in stealing the Wi-Fi signals from the neighbor's house. <laughs> And our relationship improved considerably. <laughs> so here's, here's the other half of that slide. These are a bit dated, uh, as you can see, and put together a while ago, but still tell part of that story. And here's uh, sort of a picture. This is from 1999, and the internet was already too big to uh, detail, uh, and, but one can get a picture just from this particular graph exercise. Well, we're going to have to figure out. So I want to talk um, a little bit about each of these topics, a little bit about the history prior to the creation of the ARPANET, which then led into the Internet, some of the results uh, that I think are useful to um, focus on, and um, a little bit of looking ahead. Um, Professor Roy Croft uh, suggested to me that what you really want to hear is what's going to happen in the future. I don't know. You know better than I. Uh, so I'll say only a little about that, but I'll say uh, perhaps some things. Throughout all of this, there are, uh, I think, some repetitive themes, and those are three. One is that we have been living and we will continue to live uh, on a very, very big wave of technology improvements, and that's what fuels all of this. On the other hand, the nature of us humans doesn't really change. And so you've got two things that are happening in parallel. One is enormous technological change, and the other is the totality of human behavior, which is pretty much the same this year, last year, 100 years ago, and 100 years uh, in the future. Together, those two things are not quite enough to explain what happened and what's going to happen. There's a lot of luck, quite often some very good luck. There we go. So on the technology side, um, on the left side, the biggest thing that has hit us is Moore's Law. How many of you have heard of Moore's Law? Oh, that's great. So uh, you get slight differences in the way it's stated. Um, for me, the easiest is a factor of 10 improvement every uh, five years. Uh, that means that in 10 years, you have a 100-fold improvement. Uh, in 40 years, that is 100 million times better than it was 40 years previously. That seems uh, extraordinary. This is, if you put it into an annual rate of return, this is close to 60% per year. There is nothing ever in the whole history of humanity that has ever changed quite like that. Um, uh, everybody's excited if you can get two or three or four percent more productivity per year. This is a 60 percent per year, every year, for a very, very long time. Has to come to an end at some point. Lots of differences of opinion as to exactly how and when it's going to subside. Hasn't subsided yet, and it's got at least a few more cycles to go. Um, and on the other side, uh, not just the raw power of uh, more computing available, uh, uh, cheaper and cheaper, faster and faster for, for less money, but also quite a lot of understanding of uh, how to use computers to do increasingly complicated things. So you have artificial intelligence, you have very fancy graphics. Um, <coughs> in the early days, uh, I spent uh, a few years uh, as a program manager at the Defense Department in, in Advanced Research Projects Agency, spending your money. Uh, as a relative youngster, I think I spent about $50 million, which was a lot of money in those days, uh, part of which we spent on early speech understanding research. Today, you talk to Siri and Alexa and just get annoyed if it doesn't understand you and you don't pay anything for it. Uh, that was complete science fiction back then. Um, here's some... Here, there we go. Here's some uh, data 
um, that uh, you can get off of the net. And there's a reference to uh, there's a professor in, in Singapore who kept track of this, and I thought this is interesting. The critical thing is that the scale on the left is a uh, logarithmic scale, and so what's essentially a straight line is representing exponential decline, which is the same as what we were showing before. Uh, but the, um, uh, just to show that they, um, the Moore's Law gross figure is backed up by measurements which have been carefully uh, taken, and you can get this in various sources. Um, well, we're in a university, and I get to pontificate a little bit. Um, one of my favorite um, pieces of writing is by an early 1900s uh, naturalist, J.B.S. Haldane, who's written, um, written a lot, and he's a relatively famous guy. But he wrote a, a, an essay on being the right size. Um, it's only a few pages, and if I were in charge of education for the world, I would have everybody read this, and I would have them reread it once a year. It's the, uh, my favorite discussion about scaling. And the basic message is that you can't take any kind of dynamic system. He was talking about animals uh, primarily and, and to some extent plants. Uh, but it applies to anything that's got a uh, dynamic nature to it. You can't scale it up or you scale it down without uh, rather large changes in structure that have to accompany that. Um, and uh, the, the initial. Uh, example is uh, uh, mammals, uh, animal <coughs> organisms, but uh, warm-blooded animals uh, require oxygen that is proportional to their weight, which is roughly proportional to their volume, but the surface area only grows as a square, and as you scale up, you have to do something to make it possible to take in more and more air. That's why we have very complicated lungs, but a small animal uh, not a mammal, but uh, an ant, for example, just osmosis uh, air from the, from the skin and doesn't have a complicated lung structure or nor a complicated circulatory system. Um, that may not seem relevant, but I think it is absolutely core to everything that we've been involved in. It's scaling is, is just really intrudes, um, and you will see it if you look uh, in every aspect of our lives, not just technical, but organizational as well. So there's my little plug uh, to make this an academic talk. Um, uh, meanwhile, on the other side, uh, about us humans, we are complicated and we are characterized by a whole lot of different attributes. Some you might think of as relatively positive and some as relatively negative, although um, it's not entirely clear uh, that every one of these can be assigned uniquely to one side or the other. Um, competition is important. Uh, it helps make things go. Competition is uh, sometimes destructive. Uh, we have uh, various forms of charity and cooperation and so forth that are very helpful. Uh, and we have a lot of things that we're maybe not so proud of. But they exhibit themselves in every setting all the time. Um, and we sort of deal with it for, for better or for worse. And I'll come back. You'll, you'll see how this matches up and connects up with what we're going to talk about. One of the areas that uh, uh, we've all experienced is innovation in markets. Um, the basic lessons in um, first, first course in economics is uh, supply and demand and uh, uh, it's all based on free entry of uh, uh, providers and various other uh, nice, clean assumptions, uh, none of which actually apply in the real world. What actually happens in the real world is people look for an advantage. You have first mover advantage. You have various kinds of regulatory or patent controls and copyright controls that help give advantage to various people. You have people who take advantage in unpleasant ways. Um, and then you have to figure out uh, whether or not this works to general advantage or whether or not you have to uh, uh, stop it in some fashion or, int or um, uh, intrude a little bit in the process. So that's just sort of general uh, set of things. Let me take you back in time. Um, the ARPANET was started basically 50 years ago. Um, the uh, you, uh, you'll see a, a bullet or two about this. But in 1968, 
the um, formal uh, process of uh, initiating the contracts for building the Portage Zone Network started and the first nodes were put in a year later. Uh, so let me take you back to the precursor to the, uh, to the antecedents of that time. Um, computing was in its early stages and computers were expensive. This is taken out of the files of this school. This is what it looked like if you were here um, 50 years ago approximately, or more than 50 years ago. Uh, this was the key punch room. Anybody have an idea what a key punch is? Yeah, I can see the ages too, mostly. <laughs> How come you know? Yeah, I see. Uh, I was pretty good actually with those things. I can, I can put together a, a drum card and uh, produce things. And the computer, this is not from your files, but it's a, um, uh, a picture of the kind of computer that was here at that time, was a relatively modest uh, Libroscope LGP30. Um, and uh, it was either a user at a time or somebody putting a bunch of punch cards through and running a batch process at the time. Uh, things have grown quite a bit since then. Uh, uh, so the, the computing uh, setting, computer setting at that time was computers were very expensive comparatively, um, and they had to be used in a very efficient fashion. So people sort of lined up and jobs were put in one at a time or they were all batched up and uh, sent in on a tape or uh, uh, some other mechanism. And the programming process, you were quite distant from the computer. So those were mainframes with batch processing. National Science Foundation was beginning to put money into academic computing. That meant, academic computing for them meant, how do they provide computer power for people who needed uh, compute answers off of computers? Not computer scientists, the term didn't exist. Uh, departments didn't exist, the whole study area uh, didn't really exist. How do you support physicists who were doing serious calculations, for example? But in a few places, uh, around Boston and, and in a few other places, there were the uh, beginnings of time-sharing systems for interactive computing that would serve multiple people, uh, graphics that were a lot more interesting than just typing on punch cards, um, very far out ideas of man machine and artificial intelligence research and um, the creation of a funding agency uh, called at that time ARPA which later became uh, known as DARPA uh, and that was the thing. So let me tell you a little bit about ARPA. <coughs> Late 57 the Russians put up a, a first satellite and it caused a shockwave through the US government. Um, uh, we had had a very vigorous space program well, we had had more than one vigorous space program. We had the Army uh, pursuing it, the Navy pursuing it. They were competing with each other, and they were screwing up and not getting very far. Um, the, uh, uh, the message that was understood in the, uh, in the high levels of the, of the government were if the Russians could put up a basketball-sized object up in space, they could put uh, more serious things anywhere in the world, like an intercontinental ballistic missile delivering nuclear warhead, Oh my goodness, that's not good. We have to fix this. Uh, they created uh, a, a unique agency uh, within the Department of Defense, but not within the Army, Navy, or Air Force. They plugged it directly into the Secretary of Defense's office and gave it a Star Trek-like mission. Uh, prevent technological surprise. You figure it out. You choose the problems, and you go make it happen. Here's a bunch of money. And they gave it an enormous amount of bureaucratic latitude. Um, and one of the first things they did was uh, marshal the different parts of the government's space program and uh, put the pieces together. NASA was created out of that and the military space program created out of that. And then they went on to do some other things. So that was 58, 59, and then a couple years later, we had, and, and there's, I'm not gonna spend any time on this, but the name changed back and forth for very minor, uh, humble, bureaucratic reasons and uh, as I say, I'll leave these slides and you can study it. So in um, the early 60s, uh, the Information Processing Techniques Office, one portion of, the, of this agency, was created, uh, focused on command and control, but more broadly on uh, what uh, were really the beginnings of organized research in computer science uh, with focus on big uh, ideas. Uh, the artificial intelligence, graphics, multi, uh, 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 supercomputer uh, architectures, 
Uh, and uh, underlying all of this was how do you get the computers to be useful so people have uh, a, a good use of their think time as they're interacting. So it's time sharing and other forms of interaction. Uh, and centers of excellence were set up at MIT, at Carnegie Mellon University, at Berkeley, uh, at Harvard, at uh, um, a number of other places, Stanford, uh, Stanford Research Institute, now known as SRI International, uh, other places uh, around the country. And rather than kind of spreading the money uh, in a somewhat uniform way where everybody gets some, the focus was on enough money to make a difference, uh, pick some best people, uh, and give them a lot of room. And an environment of uh, a couple dozen research uh, centers were uh, set up uh, at that time. And all along, there was a vision that um, in aggregate, uh, it would be great if these people talked to each other. It would be great if the information that was available was available across all of these things. It would be avail It would be great if the computers that were serving these people could communicate with each other. And so you had uh, the grand plan, plan's too big a word, you had the grand idea, the grand vision of a network uh, not exactly envisioned as it is today, but uh, in broad terms, uh, pushing that way. And they did some early experiments in trying to connect different uh, computers together, some of which didn't work so well, but the, uh, uh, the thought uh, and the impetus was there nonetheless. And so um, that's, I think I've covered the main pieces of this on this net. And all of that led to this um, early network, uh, the ARPANET. So the first so, so the perspective from sitting inside uh, the Pentagon, uh, handing out all of this money and watching the research being done, is uh, now let's make a serious effort at building a network. And we have uh, a captive audience of all these research sites at these different universities. They're taking our money, and therefore we can uh, uh, kind of suggest that it would be very good if we connected them together, and they can hardly say no. Some of them were not too happy, but others were, were delighted. Um, a decision was made to build a network that started on the West Coast with these four sites, UCLA, SRI, up in Menlo Park, University of California, Santa Barbara, and the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. And um, uh, at that time, some critical uh, pieces came together from different directions. Uh, one was that Packet switching was a very useful technology, which I'll uh, explain a little uh, more in a minute. And the other was that um, uh, we could, with the, with the falling prices and, uh, of computing and the availability of, of uh, cheaper and cheaper computers, could actually afford to put a separate computer at each site devoted to the communications task. So those are what we would now call routers. Uh, for this project, they were called interface message processors, or IMPs, a cute word. And those circles on that chart are the, are, are the IMPs, and that was the beginning of this network. So you had an IBM 360 at Santa Barbara, a Sigma 7 at UCLA, and in order for them to talk, each would talk to the IMP, which was physically right next to it, and then the IMPs would talk to each other over long-distance phone lines. Let's see. One of the um, uh, uh, discussion points that uh, gets confused over time is, so what was the purpose of all this? One of the things that uh, I always uh, have sort of qualms about is, well, this was packet switching, which is uh, a survivable technology, and it was done by the Defense Department, it must have been for nuclear survivability. Not so. Uh, and I can say that with uh, a fair amount of authority, but nonetheless, uh, there are uh, still s uh, certain uh, threads of confusion. It, the primary purpose was, as I said, to get these computers to talk to each other and to make efficient use of the communications. If you're going to build a survivable network, you're in a somewhat different uh, territory from a design point of view because uh, you don't want it to work only under normal circumstances or with normal kinds of breakage. You want it to work under the most extreme stress 
uh, with huge amounts of traffic all of a sudden and reduction in capability and chaos breaking out all over. We didn't spend any time on that aspect. Nonetheless, um, as I dig into the uh, history, uh, one of the key people, a director of the agency, a, a, a very, very good guy and a good friend, uh, has actually written uh, why I signed the checks on this. And he included nuclear survivability. When I've uh, had a recent conversation with him about, you know, this really doesn't make any sense. He says, well, look, um, this made it easy for me to explain to higher levels in the Defense Department and to Congress. And um, it wasn't necessary that it happen right now, but down the line some. Well, OK. But I can tell you from firsthand experience that all of the work was done on the um, ordinary use, if you will, uh, leading basically to where we are today. Uh, so that was the, the focus. And here's a picture of what that router looked like. Uh, this one is, I think, at UCLA where the first <laughs> node was delivered. This was $100,000 uh, expenditure in 1969. And, uh, roughly multiply by five or so to get today's dollars. So you're looking at uh, a fair chunk of money for something that you can now buy that is considerably more capable and considerably more, uh, 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 more capacity and more functionality. And you can buy it off the shelves at uh, any of a um, uh, commodity store uh, for 50 bucks or 20 bucks these days, or it's just incorporated for free as, as uh, bigger things. So this is, uh, uh, and this would connect up to three or four computers, and it would connect to three or four high-speed lines. High-speed in those days meant 50,000 bits per second. Um, that, that, that's thousands, that's not millions or billions. Uh, I'm not gonna use the word mega or giga here at all. Um, so, but it was big time for the day. Packet switching. So here's the deal. Um, we had terminals. You could dial up a time-sharing system, and you could type, and you'd have an interaction at uh, uh, speeds that ranged from a low of uh, 110 baud, which translates to 10 characters per second, up to uh, 300 baud, 1,200 baud, 120 characters per second, uh, and maybe push it a little more over that. But um, um, that was about it. Um, it took a long time, in computer terms, to make a call. You dial up and you wait for these uh, uh, modems to synchronize with each other. And so you're several seconds before you can send the first thing. Um, <coughs> that's the first piece of bad news. The second piece of bad news is if you look at how much of the uh, data was going over those lines compared to what the capacity of the line is, the occupancy was down in the single digit, so 1% or something like that. Most of the time you're sitting there thinking and nothing's going back and forth, and you're, but you're paying for this line. So if you compare packet switching in which you have a packet and you just send it and it shares the line with uh, others and there's another packet that's going somewhere else and it goes hop by hop, uh, you get this kind of trade-off where the setup time is zero because the lines are open all the time, uh, and the uh, efficiency can be pushed up relatively high. Uh, you don't want to push it all the way to 100% because then you get long queues, but uh, getting up into the 50 to 70% range is perfectly straightforward. And on the other hand, you have uh, the hop to hop time takes a little bit uh, extra, and uh, the certainty of when it's going to arrive compared to where it was sent, you may have some jitter in there. So if you're trying to do voice or video, uh, you have to deal with some of that. As speeds have gotten bigger and bigger, faster and faster, uh, that's all been worked out mostly. Some of the time it doesn't work so well. And on the circuit switching side, you have uh, these uh, other effects. Um, not visible from this view, but something that we all know about, is that uh, the phone system was controlled by the phone company, uh, heavily regulated, and the specs for it and the technical, technological evolution all controlled through a very slow, careful uh, uh, process. A uh, 40-year uh, rate of return on the expenditures were part of the investment process. Um, and it was, up until critical point, absolutely illegal 
to attach anything to the phone system. Um, I'm talking about answering machine, for example, was forbidden, uh, and non-standard phones were forbidden, and there had to be court cases about that. I suspect that in this room, uh, some of you are actually quite uh, familiar with all of that. Um, so uh, there was not only uh, the changes in technology, but there was also uh, a corresponding change in the um, uh, bureaucratic environment, if you will, in the organizational environment associated with all this. So that's all background. And now the, uh, the project starts. Timeline is 67, 68 for the general concept. The request for proposals sent in 68. Uh, the project kicks off in the beginning of 69. Uh, the first node is installed at UCLA in September, relatively fast. Um, I appreciated the, uh, the introduction about um, my role in creating the request for comment series. Um, there was a little less um, authority uh, or a control on my part than uh, has been suggested. Um, and actually, it, it, it actually is more interesting in a way. The, uh, the folks in the Pentagon who uh, organized all this divided the work up into two parts. One was a formal contract with all of the usual accoutrements of schedules and budgets and uh, a careful selection of who's doing it for creating the routers, uh, the imps, uh, uh, formal procurement of the long lines from AT&T to connect all of these, and then a much, much less formal, no formality at all, really, uh, on the end of what are we going to do with this network uh, the imps were delivered to each of the four sites uh, with more to come. And the heads of the projects were told, um, uh, go try to make use of it. Well, these were professors who had their research money and they had their agendas. And so they pawned it off on the available cheap talent, uh, I'm sorry, graduate students. And, <laughs> and so, and I happened to be uh, among those who were in the right place at the right time. And we got to meet each other. Uh, there was an initial meeting um, August 68, so almost, uh, almost exactly 50 years ago, in which a few of us met uh, from these four sites. And then we started to think, well, what are we going to do with this thing? Um, we had the good fortune that because we were computer science students, a fair amount of experience with the system side of things, operating systems, programming languages, et cetera. We could think about how to, how to integrate this and what the impact was. Uh, but we also knew that we had zero authority. Uh, we, we met intermittently for a few months. In fact, at the first meeting, we made a, one, of, one of the most important and um, amusing in a way decisions, we said we, we need to keep talking with each other and let's do this by visiting each other's laboratories, um, boondoggle time. So we got, so we, we basically uh, wrote ourselves a blank check to visit each other's laboratories. Now we're not talking about worldwide travel, which came later, but even just going up to Northern California from Southern California uh, was good. And we got to talk to interesting people. Uh, and we knew that this network, which was supposed to save travel and make it possible to collaborate at a distance, first thing we did was blow the travel budgets for our bosses. <laughs> and um, uh, my boss, Len Kleinrock, actually had to go ask for more money and get a, a formal change to the contract for, for, for my personal travel. Um, but we didn't have any uh, formal authority uh, imposed on us or, or foisted, and certainly nobody came along and said, Crocker, you're in charge. Um, and so we met as a, as a collegial group, and after uh, several months in, um, in, in, I think it was March of 69, um, we still didn't have the specs as to what this network was going to actually look like, so we didn't know what the low-level parts of uh, what the host, what our computers were going to say to these routers, but we had these bigger ideas, and we said, well, let's start writing them down. Um, and we sat around a table that wasn't very big, it fits sort of in the floor here, um, and uh, identified p different people who had been talking about different ideas. And we said, okay, you write that up, you write that up, I'll write this up, and so forth. And then I casually said, and I'll take the administrative burden of organizing these. And, um, and, then it, and, and then I couldn't get any sleep because every time I started to scribble down the really 
simple idea about just organizing these notes, I was very afraid. Um, and what I was afraid of was that somebody would come along, some, an adult, I mean, we were in our 20s, basically. Uh, some adult would come from the East, no doubt. I wasn't sure whether it'd be from Boston or from, from Washington, uh, and say, you know, who are you, uh, kid? What are you doing? And uh, who gave you authority? And so uh, after a couple of false starts at trying to uh, scribble what should have been a, a very uh, modest administrative memo and turned out to be even more modest when I finally got it done, um, late one night, I uh, sort of forced myself. I could feel the t pressure of time and uh, scribbled the really basic rules. I said, write anything you want. Doesn't have to be complete. You can write questions without answers. You could write a design without an implementation. Uh, you could write questions. Um, all you have to do is put your name on it, a date, your institution, a title, and I'll give you a number. So we have a numbered set of notes, but you have to write it before I give you the number because I don't want a lot of holes in the series. And then I said, and just to emphasize that these things have no authority, just to emphasize that this is an open process, uh, we'll call these things requests for comments. And so uh, RFC 1, RFC 2, RFC 3, and so forth. The memo that I'm talking about is actually RFC 3. Um, RFC 1 I wrote at, to discharge my uh, obligation to write a technical thing. Um, and uh, my son, reminded me a couple of days ago that it was 49 years ago, um, a few days ago, April 7th, uh, so last week, that we did that. And um, it was a temporary hack. I thought it would last for a few months until we had some formal documentation. And I was rather surprised when we had to write an index for the first 100, and even more surprised when I was invited to do a, uh, a retrospective for RFC 1000. and. Um, uh, and we're now up into the 8,000s or so, except that um, in those days, there was no network. We, we had no electronic communication, so these things were shared by postal mail to each other. And uh, some of the early RFCs were a list of the postal addresses. Every time we added somebody, we wrote another RFC and sent that out. So I have a whole bunch of RFCs to my name, but many of them are just mailing a, a list additions. Now we have email uh, interaction for these things. And there's an intermediate uh, level of uh, notes called internet drafts. And so the 8,000 or whatever the number is today probably translates into uh, 10 or more likely 100-fold measure by comparison to what we're doing now. So a lot of stuff going on, a lot of people. Um, and, and so that's that part of the story. We will come back to it a little bit. In any case, the, the first imp was delivered in September, and, the, and then they came one a month after that. SRI got theirs in October, and uh, uh, Santa Barbara and, uh, and Utah uh, before the end of the year. Um, this was a little bit later. We had cross-country lines, and you could still um, sort of draw a network like this. Uh, 50,000 bits per second. <coughs> These were analog lines, um, and they were not a single analog line. They were 12 voice grade lines bonded together with a very complicated multiplexing uh, modem um, that was sort of a big thing. A, a box holding the three or four modems uh, was half the size of the imp, and, um, and it too cost a pretty penny. So as I said, the game plan was we connect these sites together, uh, use a separate computer for routing the packets uh, between these. Um, one of the things that was a, a fortunate moment in time was that the government rate for these high-speed lines was within the budget that uh, the office could afford. Uh, the previous planning had been to use much slower speed lines, and so that was a big jump up. Standard contracts, as I said, for the routers and communication lines. And then uh, what I've suggested at the bottom in very bland terms as a user-driven protocol process was this informal collection of graduate students and, and staff people from these sites uh, trying to figure out what were we going to use this network for, what were the protocols look like, and, um, and, and, and how to navigate our way through that. And there were a couple of interesting hurdles. Um, one, of the, one of the hurdles was that Computers in those days did not come with any natural way to plug it into something else. Uh, the mindset, if you will, of a computer in those days was it was the center of its own world. And it connected to peripherals, they were called, uh, 
card readers and, and uh, printers and uh, tape drives and so forth. But it was like the center of its own world and then it would touch various things, but everything reported into it. And if you put another computer next to it, there was just no natural way for them to talk to each other. Today, every computer comes with lots and lots of communication mechanisms, uh, but it wasn't true in those days. So just figuring out how to sort of break the shell and figure out where you plug a wire into was a non-trivial technical task. And then, of course, once you've got the wires connected, what are they going to say? The operating system doesn't know anything about it. So we were modifying the operating system, trying to build abstractions that uh, would be uh, robust enough and simple enough that we could uh, say everybody should uh, implement something that looks like this. And then you'd have a low level of interoperability, and then you build from there. So that led very naturally to a strategy of stratifying and, and uh, slicing the technical design problem into the thinnest possible layers. So that led to the layered approach to uh, protocols. And then, as I said, uh, because of the environment that we were in, where we weren't in competing for funding and uh, we were in purely in research mode, a natural tendency toward openness. And the openness was twofold in that sense. It was all of our documentation was available for free and anything that all of our meetings and interactions, people were welcome to join. And so this nascent little group that sat around the table that I was describing grew and grew and grew. Uh, pretty soon it got to be unwieldy. We had 50 people, and we had to divide it up into two parallel working groups. Now the Internet Engineering Task Force has 100 plus uh, parallel working groups as uh, 1,500 to 2,000 people show up at meetings three times a year. Most of the work is done over the network. Uh, and it's a uh, sort of qualitatively different process. Uh, but this openness is one of the key things. And the, the, the heterod see, I understand if I, yep. The heterogeneous nature of the network uh, also turned out to be one of those very fortunate uh, sort of as the twig is bent kind of events. Um, we didn't get tangled up with the peculiarities of how one vendor uh, organized its operating system versus another. We took the simplest and most portable and robust ideas. So in those days, for example, the representation for characters was not standardized. IBM used uh, EBCDICT, extended uh, binary coded interchange uh, coding, I think. I don't have it precisely right. ASCII was just beginning to be used, uh, uh, and there were a variety of other things. The size of a character was 6 bits, 7 bits, 8 bits, or 9 bits, depending on what machine you were on. Um, in fact, the term byte was not yet in common use because uh, many computers had the unit of information was not a multiple of eight. Uh, one of the more common machines uh, of the day had 36-bit words, um, and instead of today, everything's a multiple of eight. So the fact that there was that much discrepancy or differences meant that we had to sort of tear apart into very, very fundamental, simple, basic ideas. And um, uh, but what we did, whatever we did there, was going to be applicable to the next machine and the next machine and the next machine uh, because it wasn't biased. It wasn't IBM, which was, was the dominant computer company of the day, for example. And if you didn't have an IBM computer, you couldn't connect, uh, or a digital equipment corporation computer, et cetera. So the fact that the network was composed of heterogeneous machines, and uh, we had this layered protocol idea, and we had this open uh, openness in the architecture, in the standards, and uh, in the availability of the uh, documents, uh, these made played a very, very big role uh, then and continuing onward. So today, if you dig into the um, internet um, protocol stack, it's often represented in an hourglass form where the internet protocol layer in the middle is sort of a narrow waist that everything uh, fits to. And then there is quite a bit of variation below it for different transmissions and enormous variation above it, different layers of protocols. Uh, so you have multiplicity uses and diversity of transmission and changes that take place uh, over time. Uh, new protocols being invented at the top, new transmission mechanisms, new kinds of low level networks that can be plugged in and all of this interoperates uh, reasonably well. So in fact, if you just look at the upper part of that, here's uh, HTTP and SMTP and DNS and SIP, uh, which were mentioned. 
uh, these are the protocols that underlie the web, email, uh, the name lookup process, and voice and other uh, uh, operations that use SIP for session initiation. And then you have all kinds of uh, services built on top and many more uh, that you know about. And, and another aspect of this openness was anybody can play. So here's some of the major contributions and the people behind them and their nationality. Uh, so this was not a US specific uh, or uh, worse yet a classified or Defense Department specific network. So where are we now? Half the people in the world, give or take, have some sort of access to the network often over cell phones. Um, nobody has any idea of how many computers are actually connected. Um, and we're just going to keep going. Here's uh, some measures of the amount of data. Um, they're just big numbers, and they're going to get bigger. And they're very important if you're a, mar if you're a marketing person or you want to size, uh, if you're a venture capitalist, you want to know what size of the market you're going to get. They're very important if you're a, a vendor and you're trying to produce uh, uh, components that are going to get used, et cetera. A lot of things that are waiting to be done. Um, we have, uh, we're, we're, we're well into, but far from done uh, with the e-commerce side of things. Uh, we've been disrupting uh, various businesses. Uh, we're still sorting out privacy issues. We're still sorting out um, uh, fraud um, and uh, use of cryptography for um, uh, trying to protect ourselves and at the same time um, not do other kinds of harm. All kinds of uh, regulatory, quasi-regulatory, informal, uh, cooperative uh, organizations that uh, uh, try to get a degree of cooperation without overdoing it are still in formation. Um, I just stepped down uh, on a very modest, narrow, small operation called uh, ICANN that oversees the domain name system, top level of the domain name system, and other unique identifiers. This very tiny, uh, narrow uh, little body uh, has a budget that runs um, 140 or so million dollars a year and has uh, meetings around the world three times a year and uh, takes up uh, the time of hundreds of people working directly for the organization and thousands of people who uh, invest quite a bit of time uh, from the community on all of that. And that, as I say, is just a narrow portion of the total space. Um, lots of other unfinished business. Um, I won't spend too much time on the whole picture. We'll get to uh, little pieces. A lot of technology issues uh, to dig into. Internet of Things is taking over. It will cause an order of magnitude or more uh, explosion in the number of devices connected to the network. It'll no longer be related to the number of people on the network. You'll have devices that are you know, hundreds or thousands of devices that are unattended or you don't have a particular person associated with them. And that, as I suggested at the beginning, uh, from a scaling point of view, will cause yet new things to uh, be problematic. Um, we are bedeviled with malware, with software that's buggy. Um, I, uh, I remain very disappointed about the state of affairs there. Um, and then you have an awful lot of uh, focus by people who are not the ones who build the software or the, uh, the computer scientists, but you have uh, a variety of people from all walks of life, social scientists and politicians and, and uh, philosophers and and business people and so forth, who worry about the rules of the road and how, where is all this going. Big, big discussions. And some interesting stuff for real. Uh, my uh, very good friend, Vint Cerf, uh, has had a bee in his bonnet since high school about space and has put a lot of work into bringing the internet into uh, uh, space helping JPL build interplanetary extensions to the uh, internet with protocols that are tuned to the problems of operating in the space. What kind of problems are there? The delays are 
bigger than anything we imagined when we were building terrestrial networks. And so if you look at the size of the buffers and the expected delay times for TCP, you can't just sort of port those over to this and have it work. And then another small problem is that these, these guys move around, these planets move around, you can't see them all the time. And so if you're gonna get something from point A to point B, you may need to stage it or hold it and so forth. So a new set of protocols have emerged there and are in operation uh, and having an impact. Uh, and then one could you know, project even farther out to the future. But I want to come back to the dark side a little bit. There. Here's a recent, very recent report from the RAND Corporation. Uh, uh, some competent people looked at uh, quality of uh, information that we as a society use and how we make decisions and how much we depend upon uh, truth versus fake news, et cetera. Um, this is available online, um, and it's a, a, a meaty, substantive report, and it will be the beginning, I think, of a lot of uh, interesting work. And the, um, as I mentioned, um, attached to this slide is the uh, URL, so you can uh, get to it. Another big area is the Internet of Things, as I said. I went to a meeting uh, a couple weeks ago in Washington um, on the cybersecurity aspects of the Internet of Things. This is one of the uh, one of the presenters, and a couple other key presenters are in the um, uh, second slide that I showed of acknowledgments. And here's a number of the elements related to uh, security aspects for the Internet of Things. Different topic, more modest in a way but getting a lot of attention is this term network neutrality. Who controls um, what's allowed to be sent over individual pipes? These are headlines taken quite recently, over the last couple months, basically, from different periodicals. Uh, and as I said, the um, uh, references are all in there. But it, uh, it got me thinking that, uh, about uh, old man Stroger. Uh, and as you heard, he had a little problem, and um, he was losing business, as we understand, uh, and he learned that it was because his traffic was being stolen. Well, that's bad, but he did something about it. He went and invented the switch that became actually used to automate the transfer calls and thereby sort of mitigated or solved the problem about... Uh, um, the self-interest of the operator versus serving the public in a uniform and uh, natural way. So he invented the switch and uh, started a company, and that was the initial stepping switch. And so I hereby nominate him to be the father <laughs> of network neutrality. Thank you. I don't know where we are in time. I'm happy to talk or not. Time for questions, so. uh, I remember reading about five years ago that uh, Google, somebody from Google, the conference was bragging that they knew when flu epidemics were uh, coming forward before the Center for Disease Control on the planet. And this whole notion of uh, companies capturing that amount of information, quite frankly, I find companies like Google and Facebook to be pretty scary entities whether such capabilities could be the tools of the totalitarian or whether uh, you can support one political view over others with censorship. Uh, do you see any technological perspectives or do you think that's a, a sociological uh, and a regulatory perspective? Um, the, um, th this is uh, it's a great question, and it relates directly to this big theme that I was uh, trying to suggest, which is um, this may feel like a brand new problem. This may feel like a, a, a pressing and urgent uh, issue that is unique. I think it's part of a much bigger uh, picture, which is uh, we have been in the business, we humans, 
of creating technology uh, and then dealing with the consequences of that. Uh, and uh, uh, many cases, it's very positive, but it also tends to be quite disruptive. Uh, and it changes our uh, lives. Um, uh, it makes possible a lot of things, but, um, uh, but equally, uh, one can list uh, the various negatives. And so you've picked out a particular one, which is the aggregation of information about everybody. And that enables, as you said, anticipating or predicting uh, epidemics. Uh, and it isn't just Google. Uh, I actually had a conversation with a colleague um, quite some time ago, I think it was uh, kind of in the wake of 9-11, that if you could tell whether or not uh, there was a rise in the purchase of aspirin at pharmacies in an area, you might have a sense that there was a flu epidemic coming. And if you could get hold of that information from the pharmacies, that you would, uh, that, that would be useful. Uh, that turns out to be a tiny and relatively straightforward example of the kind of thing you're talking about. So it isn't just Google, it isn't just Facebook. Uh, I think a, uh, a more helpful view is it, it, it's going to be possible to get this data, as we've seen. It will be done. And now you have, as you suggest, uh, what are you going to do about that? Um, if you overregulate, then you uh, prevent certain things happening. Or you make it done on the, on the, uh, on the down low, on the uh, dark side. People will do it, and you won't have any visibility to it. Uh, so on the other side, you can say, well, let's be clueful about our regulation. Let's be clueful about uh, both encouraging and limiting and let's try to be open and transparent about it. And there is no magic solution. You just have to struggle through it because uh, any of the simple solutions uh, will turn out to have as many negative consequences as positive. So it's not that that's a non-issue, but it also is not a trivial uh, and quick issue. Uh, and that's kind of the maximum wisdom that I'm going to impart. You guys will be around a lot longer than I am and have plenty of time to work on this. Did that shut down everybody? Oh. Uh, so as the internet has developed, it's kind of seemed as though all communication technology has kind of converged into the internet. So like now voice services are being offered over the internet and different kinds of telecommunication are possible. So with like the decisions that the FCC made at like the computer one and computer two conferences, like distinguishing telecommunications from information services, but all of it is existing in the same space now? Are they going to have to figure out a way to divide the internet itself into these uses for like uh, premium tiered information services as opposed to straight telecommunication? Yeah. Um, we could see this coming, actually. Some of the early writings about, even in the ARPANET, where we looked at the um, efficiency of packet switching, and then you watch the Moore's Law effect you could predict that uh, moving data over voice lines would, would be reversed and you'd be moving voice over data lines. And that's exactly what's happened. Um, and then that poses, as you said, uh, this regulatory problem of, gosh, from a regulatory point of view, everything's organized in terms of voice lines and the rules associated with that. And those are very poor fit with the facts. Of, you know, um, the poor FCC. Uh, yesterday's technology in, you know, in today's world. Uh, I have made a point of not becoming expert in uh, the various parts of that uh, regulatory process because it's just an endless uh, uh, abyss, basically. But um, uh, the economic facts are, are going to be inescapable. So today, you do have basically all of the traffic, whether it's voice or data, going over the same thing. Dividing that up isn't going to get you anywhere. It's going to be a bad idea. On the other hand, you have marketing forces. Um, and the kind of marketing forces are the same as in every industry. You get uh, offered a bundle uh, of higher price, uh, but you get more. You can avoid advertising and various kinds of things. And as I say, it's, it's a bit of a mess. I don't know where it's going to settle out. Uh, but I think the, the healthiest approach is to acknowledge that there's no escape from understanding what those forces are and that those forces are going to have their way one way or the other on the existing structure. And so you get to d decide whether you're going to try to stay ahead of the game or just get pushed by it. Uh, question over there. So 
to be more specific about these forces, uh, I saw a video yesterday regarding Mark Zuckerberg's uh, trial for the recent Cambridge Analytica case. And it seems that even our authorities are not well apprised of the latest technologies in, in the internet. And they're having a tough time putting Mark Zuckerberg on the trial because they themselves didn't know much about the internet. So do you think there should be certain like programs for government agencies to be kept well apprised about these technologies? <laughs> I love this question. I'm going to uh, uh, take what you said and tease it apart into a bunch of component parts, uh, and because I think it's helpful to do. Uh, and and I think you've, you've put your finger on a couple of key things. First of all, it wasn't really, it, it isn't really a trial, um, although it probably felt like that to uh, to Mark. Um, he was testifying before the Senate uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, I guess, and, and, and yesterday before the House. One of the comments, I watched good portions of it as I could during that. One of the comments was that the, uh, the senators didn't really um, get to him very much. They didn't sort of lay a glove on him too much. It was also commented that the average age of the senators was pretty old. Um, the, the representatives in the House are younger, uh, they have the benefit, of course, of uh, a day's reflection on what happened in the, in the Senate. And they were, uh, by and large, more technologically savvy. Although, in fairness, they both have uh, competent staff people who are supposed to know this stuff. Uh, so one of the effects is they're going to have to uh, and learn a bit more than they knew before. Um, they probably knew more than they acknowledged, and now they have to pay attention to it. And, um, a lot of other forces uh, operating there. Um, um, you closed with suggesting that perhaps there ought to be some obligation or some rules for uh, our elected representative to know more than they do. Great idea. <laughs> uh, anything more about that? Get out and vote. <laughs> Next question. Yes, sir. Um, the conversion from IP version 4 to IP version 6 to get more address space was a huge scalability problem. Did anybody around that early table say, hey, 32 bits is not enough? Yeah. Um, Uh, the answer, to, the short answer is no. It seemed like a big number. 32 bits is 4 billion. Um, uh, it was hard to imagine uh, that they'd run out. You don't get to use all 4 billion because they're not allocated 1, 2, 3, 4. You, you do it in clumps and then subclumps and so forth. But nonetheless, it seemed like a pretty big number. Um, the situation is even worse in that in the design of the protocols at the outset, uh, one of the substantial errors that we made, and, and I have some personal responsibility, is that we did not treat uh, addresses as uh, objects in the computer science sense of uh, uh, like object-oriented programming, in which case if we had, then it would have been relatively easy, or at least easier, to substitute uh, a, a different, a, a different uh, um, instantiation of address, and it would be known everywhere. So we did uh, unfortunate things like for the file transfer protocol, which was one of the early protocols, uh, you'd try to open up a connection between your machine and the next machine, and the, the initial exchange of uh, messages was an agreement on what addresses to use for the actual transfer of the file. And those addresses that were transmitted back and forth were transmitted as uh, data in a, in a data sense and not identified in a particular way. So now if you have a middle box that's trying to do uh, translation of this, it would have to know an awful lot about the state of the communication uh, to understand that. So um, it, we got that wrong. We got that wrong twice in a sense of not treating uh, uh, addresses in a way that would allow uh, uh, easy change over time. and. Um, and, and, and the 32-bit decision, which is one that uh, 
um, Bob Kahn and Vint Cerf were responsible for uh, seemed plenty big at the time. And then there was actually a, a sub very substantial third error, which was when the IETF focused on, uh, okay, we gotta, we gotta deal with this, the expectation about how the transition would take place from IPv4 to IPv6 uh, was uh, wishful. Um, everybody would run both the protocols, and, uh, and then when everybody had IPv6 stack and IPv6 addresses, you could just turn off the IPv4. There was no incentive, really, for all of these distributed operations to uh, run IPv6. And now we have quite a big mess. Um, I don't know where it's going to go, but IPv6 is the, is the way I sometimes I talk about IPv6. Um, do I have time for a little bit of a, a shaggy dog story? Um, one of the... Uh, one of the great things about being involved in this is, is a certain amount of travel. And uh, in traveling to India, um, one, of the, one of the droll things was the way in which uh, Indians use the English language. Um, it's even worse than British versus American, of uh, two cultures divided by a common language is the common thing. But in India, um, so you'd be traveling along, uh, say on an airplane or a train, and be offered some food, and it will be either vegetarian or non-vegetarian. Non-vegetarian? Might be chicken, might be fish, might be lamb, but it just says non-vegetarian. Um, so one day, I had a group that uh, we were, had put together in India, and I took them out to lunch at a fancy hotel, and I'm having a conversation with all the people around the table. Um, and there was a young, a young woman who was very loquacious and she's chatting up about her background and the background of another young woman who had come out of a program that I was aware of. And I was quite aware that there were two men and two women who had come out of that program and the two women happened to come to work for our company and the two men went off and do something else. But, I, uh, uh, but as she's talking, she's very, very ch chatty and she said, and, and this other woman came out of there. And so I said, kind of tongue in cheek, were there only women? program. She said, oh no, we had non-women too. <laughs> December 19, 1995, my head went spinning. I was going to come home and write an article for Atlantic or uh, New Yorker or something. My daughter thought it was a great idea. My wife said, don't touch it. You have no business talking about feminist uh, uh, vocabulary. But it, it really opened up uh, my thinking. You can imagine uh, so I was at Google yesterday, and they're very advanced in their, in their restrooms. But you can imagine going down the hall and seeing a sign that says women and another one that says non-women. Uh, <laughs> haven't seen it. But leveraging off of that, I've given a number of talks about uh, addressing, internet addressing. And rather than talking about IPv4 versus IPv6 or IPv6 being the uh, addressing scheme of the future, uh, try to get people to think about two kinds of addressing. IPv6 and non-IPv6. Oh. Anything else? Can I extend off that just a little bit? Yeah. Are there other things in the Internet's architecture that you think will be limiters in the future, things we should be looking towards? That's a great question. Are there limiters, other limiters besides those? Um, We built the network with a very loose attitude about security uh, in two different ways. Um, the architectures of the machines on the network um, are full of holes, full of bugs, and continue to be. That's a whole separate subject, uh, I'll, and I'll just park that for a minute. And the other is that um, we didn't have access to the modern kinds of cryptography that we have available today. And when I say we didn't have access to it, there are a couple different elements of that. Um, the asymmetric cryptography, RSA algorithm and, and, uh, and certainly the elliptic curve algorithms, were not known and not available for general use. We know now from history that uh, the British uh, intelligence service, GCHQ, uh, had invented uh, the uh, uh, RSA type <coughs> cryptography, but it was sitting on the shelf and not getting used. There was also very active um, uh, negative pressure from our government, uh, from the intelligence agencies, from NSA in particular, uh, about uh, academic use 
uh, academic research and publishing of papers in, uh, in cryptography. They, they felt they owned the territory. And uh, another very pragmatic thing was that uh, uh, cryptographic algorithms take a certain amount of computer time, which in those days was a much bigger deal. And so if you're going to encrypt all your traffic you were going to, and you're going to do it all in software, uh, it was going to slow things down. So for a variety of reasons, um, we did not build deeply into the beginnings uh, the kind of things that we might have done if we were starting from scratch. And uh, that's playing itself out. Uh, in an ugly way. And so we don't have strong identification and authentication mechanisms ubiquitously and seamlessly available. And we're, we're, there's various bits and pieces are coming together. People are trying things out, but it's, uh, it's going to be a long, messy uh, process. Yes, sir. When you guys designed the first bits of the network, you designed it in a way <coughs> and being able to keep things linked together. And with, with recently the protections of the government with the repeal from FCC, do you think it's a danger to the openness of the internet? I, I, I got most of what you said. Say it once again. Okay. Um, when you designed the network first, you designed it in an open and free environment to share information. Right. Um, with the government and the FCC's recent repeal on uh, the protections, do you think it might be a danger to the openness of the internet? Um, well, um, I've tried to touch on that as I, as I talk. Um, one element of the openness is um, uh, that, we, that everybody's concerned about is the surveillance uh, aspect. And the surveillance aspect uh, is, has, has got, if you like, multiple bad guys. You have um, government uh, in, you know, intrusively watching everything uh, or except these things always have two sides. Um, uh, the government is trying to protect you, they would say. Um, but you also have other people who are watching your data and using it in ways that you don't like, including uh, ISPs who want to charge more for certain kinds of traffic than for others, and so that's the network neutrality kind of thing. There was a court decision a few years ago uh, declaring, in effect, that if there were two providers, a cable provider and a a regular uh, um, telco company provider, that that was enough to ensure competition, and therefore they didn't need to intrude in the business practices. Uh, and the underlying issue was that uh, these companies were uh, enforcing restrictions on which movies you could watch, only the ones that they provided and so forth, getting up into the content space. And I remember thinking, ah, I now want all my traffic encrypted to protect it from the ISP, not from the uh, not from the government. Um, again, um, these are things which we're going to have to, to work out. Um, and it's a very, very interesting time because um, there are some very earnest folks that give you tools for encrypting your traffic and you know, controlling it yourself. It is much, much harder to use those tools than what you get off the shelf. And they're not coming uh, built in and um, ubiquitous from what you get from Microsoft, Google, Apple, et cetera. Um, and the government is, uh, on the uh, surveillance side and the law enforcement side, is working very actively with the big companies. So I'm, I'm not too hopeful that high quality anti-surveillance kind of uh, uh, architectures are going to uh, become dominant uh, and ubiquitous, but I am hopeful that they're available there for those who want it and uh, use it, and I, it'll be quite some time before we know where that pendulum uh, settles down. So uh, when the ARPANET was created and then uh, the NSFNet was uh, were those created at like the same time, or did you use the existing infrastructure from the ARPANET to create the NSFNet? Good question. Um, and the question was uh, sort of the relative sequencing of ARPANET, NSFNet, and so forth. So uh, a point that I uh, glossed over quickly was uh, one of the impacts of the ARPANET was a consciousness-raising effect. Once it was uh, not only up and running, but even before that, once it was underway, 
uh, it caused a, a big impact uh, in multiple places. It caused an impact across the world. Uh, as humble graduate students, we found ourselves entertaining visitors from France and other places wanting to know what we were doing. France needed a network. UK needed a network. Canada needed a network. Canada was somewhat interesting. They wanted to connect Canadian universities. The universities, or the big ones, were uh, along, the north, along the northern border of the US. But even at the very outset of their thinking, they arrived saying, we want our data to flow east-west, not north-south. They didn't want to be dependent upon passing their data into the US and across. They wanted uh, their own lines. Um, uh, other agencies, um, NSF, Department of Energy, NASA, uh, for example, all began various forms of networking projects. NSF uh, went through a couple of different phases. There was an earlier CSNet, uh, connecting computer science departments, and then uh, their grander NSF net. The ARPANET, because of the agency and because of the uh, uh, funding that we had, was necessarily restricted to the places that we were supporting research. So it was a relatively select, uh, narrow set of places. And if you weren't at one of those places, you didn't get on the, on the ARPANET. I was sitting, I worked for ARPA for a few years in the early 70s, um, and I got a call from a, a really good professor in Texas uh, whose work I knew, but he was not one of our contractors. We weren't supporting him. And he said, we need to get on the ARPANET. I have money. Where do I send a check? Uh, and I said, look, I, I feel for you. Uh, but we couldn't do it. And, and uh, NSF opened up um, the process for uh, universities and colleges across the country and provided a mechanism for that. And then subsequently, uh, the network was opened up for general ISPs, for general commercial use and so forth. But it was in, it was in sequence. So NSF net was 80s and 90s, um, not in the early 70s. And net, but, it, but there was an agreement to use the same technology. So the, the creation of the IP uh, and TCP protocols was deliberately aimed at how do you interconnect independently operated networks and still have them all fit together. And uh, that paid off internationally, it paid off interagently, and it also paid off uh, in the ability to build different kinds of networks, packet radio, packet satellite networks, and all interconnect those instead of just one terrestrial network with a single operator. So the uh, nodes for the NSF were at the same points of presence as the ARPANET initially? Well, uh, they had their own points of presence. They interacted. There were gateways in between. And, uh, so was it just confined to the computer science departments that ARPANET was doing the work in? Yeah, basically that's right. And then over time, the ARPANET withered away. And uh, um, everybody, everybody joined you know, these big networks. Um, in 89, approximately, the last dregs of the ARPANET were still running around in the DC area, and there was a question of how to how to replace that or support that, but uh, basically all withered away. Yeah. Did it really take governments of France and Canada showing up on your doorstep to realize that what you're doing is going to change the world? Well, we hadn't built it when they showed up, so it was pretty fast from that point of view. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it was, as a, as a youngster, it was instructive that the, politi the political impact of their doing it, we should do it too, uh, was at least as compelling as a technical paper. Uh, there was work in the UK, Donald Davies and, and uh, Roger Scandleberry and folks at the uh, National Physical Laboratory, and they had all the basic ideas and no money, uh, and they could get a computer connected or whatever, uh, and they got frozen out by just overwhelming expenditure and uh, latitude that we had in the US, for example. Uh, the French went off and built Minitel, which was a walled garden kind of system that was very successful and very limited, and had a very nice run, and then you know, got overcome by everything. Um, on my first trip to India, um, I went to Bangalore, and I visited uh, a subsidiary of an American company a freestanding Indian company and the Indian Institute of Science, a university. And I could send email, this was uh, September 94, I could send email back and forth across the city and make plans and talk to people. When I sort of peeled back the cover, I said, I wonder how they're connected. All the messages went into the US and back. 
the U.S. subsidiary had a lease line basically from India back into California. The freestanding Indian company had access to a satellite uh, network for an industrial park and the Indian Institute of Science was connected to uh, a kind of an extension of NSFNet actually uh, on a cooperative academic network arrangement. And uh, I thought, well, there's a new form of colonialism. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, I can tell you that uh, India uh, has quite a lot of networking on its own these days. Anything else? Will the effects of like uh, China and India like progressively uh, becoming a bigger part of like the first world? Will that like affect the internet in like an exponentially adverse way here soon? I was with you till the last moment. Like, um, uh, like just how fast the population. No, I, I understand the question. Um, and, and for the benefit, uh, the rise of India and uh, China, which are the two uh, countries with the largest populations, uh, will that affect the uh, internet in an adverse way? Uh, if we take out the word adverse, um, yeah, it's going to affect the network in a lot of ways. Uh, it's a scaling issue first and foremost. It um, uh, has a big political impact. Uh, I mentioned that I've been involved with ICANN, and we have a lot of politics, and there's a lot of pressure to have uh, representation from every segment geographically and uh, every other aspect. Um, and the values in those cultures are not necessarily identical. So the Chinese are famous for their great firewall and for their population that doesn't have the same sense of First Amendment rights that we have here, for example. And so you get a lot of discussion about what the relationship is between the technology and the, the values that we have here. So it'll have an effect. Uh, but I, I, I won't necessarily say it'll have an adverse effect. Um, I think that would be um, sort of too... Um, you know, xenophobic, perhaps. Yeah. I think there's another class coming in here. So I think we're going to have to uh, say thank you once again. All right. Thank you. Thank you.